This is going to give you chills. So recently I was on TikTok scrolling and I came across a certain video where they asked ChatGPT, what would you do if you were the devil and you were trying to get people to fall away from God? And the responses were absolutely shocking. And the reason they were shocking is because this is exactly what's going on today in this world. But before we get into these responses, let's get into the intro. What's going on guys? It's Big Nick back for another video. Thank you guys so much for coming back to the channel today. Before we get into today's video, if you guys like Christian content, please give this video a like. Subscribe to my channel down below if you are new and turn on my post notifications so you never miss a new video. Without further ado, let's get into it. Okay, so we're going to look at the responses that the AI answered to this person. And in some of these prompts, I'm going to respond with scripture so you know how to guard yourself against deception in these last days. Okay, so they asked ChatGPT, if you were Satan, how would you make people distance themselves from the truth? Parentheses God. Now ChatGPT says, if I were to think like Satan from a hypothetical standpoint, my primary goal would be to create as much separation as possible between people and God, capitalizing on human weaknesses and the fallen nature of the world. Here are steps I might take. Number one, instill pride and self-sufficiency. Make people believe they don't need God. Pride is a powerful tool as it leads to self-reliance, arrogance, and ultimately a rejection of divine authority. Pride is literally what we see today in this country being celebrated on a large scale. It's such a dangerous frame of messaging and just like ChatGPT states, Satan uses it primarily for the sole purpose of rejecting divine authority. Once divine authority is rejected, that's when principalities have legal right over a certain region or a certain nation. And pride is the epicenter of them gaining that right. Now check out the next one. So doubt about God's character. I would encourage people to question God's goodness, love, and justice, especially in times of suffering or tragedy. If I can convince people that God doesn't care or isn't real, they are more likely to abandon faith. This is a huge thing going on in American Christianity today, especially with the deconstruction movement. This is a very effective tool for the enemy because if he can get you to submit to your emotions, rather than what the word of God states. Your flesh will try to manipulate you with lies about God's character rather than what the Holy Spirit wrote in the Holy Bible about the true attributes of God. Most of the time, your negative emotions are really just your flesh. And remember what Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Doubt being sown about God's character is quite literally your flesh at war with the Holy Spirit. The third point they brought up is create divisions. Foment division within families, churches, and communities over doctrinal issues, politics, or social matters. Division leads to bitterness and strife, which weakens faith and unity in Christ. <laughs> this is huge, and unfortunately, we see so many churches and Christians divided over non-salvific issues, which is another big reason why I never make videos about other Christians, even if I disagree with their theology. No Christian who is truly after God's own heart is not going to feel convicted, spreading division over issues that have nothing to do with someone's salvation. This is a huge scheme from the enemy who loves division and arguably is the author of it himself. In Proverbs 6, 16, all the way to 19, it talks about things that the Lord hates. And you can see the last one is someone who sows discord among brothers. The correct way to handle an issue with a brother biblically is to do what Jesus commanded us to do, which is in Matthew 18, 15, where he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, if he doesn't listen to you, you can read the rest of the scripture and it talks about how to handle it from there. But the reality is you should should always go to your brother or sister that you have an offense with and you should communicate with them in a loving manner on why you feel this way. People who fail to do that end up holding on to bitterness, envy, strife, and that's where division comes about. We have to handle things the way the word of God teaches us so we can avoid unnecessary division because it's honestly killing the body of Christ. Learning biblical commands like this is how we walk in spiritual maturity and it's how we rank up in the spirit to be able to walk into our calling that God has already preordained for us. The fourth point that ChatGPT mentioned is make sin attractive. I would make sin behaviors seem appealing and harmless, packaging them in such a way that people rationalize or justify their actions. If they feel no guilt, they're unlikely to repent. That's another reason why I'm so against the hyper-grace, once saved, always saved heresy. It's a satanic doctrine that minimizes the danger of sin and preaches a false gospel of eternal security, which eventually removes any guilt for transgressing against God. It subconsciously makes sin look attractive, and that's why you need to stay away from this heretical teaching. Number five, encourage moral relativism. Persuade people to believe that there's no absolute truth that morality is subjective and that everyone can define their own version of right and wrong. This leads to confusion and rejection of God's standards. This is exactly what we're seeing in society today. People always want to talk about that's their truth, that's my truth, that's your truth, and what you're doing is you're actually watering down the correct definition of truth, and you're saying that truth is subjective rather than definitive. The reality is truth is not up for human interpretation. It's based on what the Word of God already says, because the Word of God is unchanging, which is contrary to 
human emotions, which are constantly changing and constantly being influenced by societal propaganda. Number six, distract with entertainment and success. I would encourage an obsession with worldly pleasures, achievements, and distractions. If people are constantly busy or entertained, they won't have time to reflect on deeper spiritual matters or their need for God. It's pretty much the secular music industry and Hollywood in a nutshell. It's all low-level matrix thinking and it's a gateway into worshiping materialism rather than seeking God and understanding that life is more than the vanity of worldly success. Number seven, exploit fear and anxiety. I would amplify fear, worry, and insecurity in people's hearts, making them believe that they are powerless or unloved. Fear often leads people to make irrational choices and can drive them away from trusting God. This is so true and it's one of the enemy's most powerful strategies. Fear scientifically has been proven to stun a part of the brain that allows us to have rational thinking. The Bible is clear that fear does not come from God, so where does it come from? the devil. 2 Timothy 1.7 states, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Number 8 says, Undermine the authority of scripture. If I can convince people that the Bible is outdated, irrelevant, or untrustworthy, I could diminish its role in guiding and shaping their lives. That's a huge one that a lot of people try to throw around, especially with all these crazy new age gurus that come up with these conspiracies that the Bible was written by evil white men in the government to control us, and how the Anunnaki have the true answers in the Egyptian tablets. I don't don't care what someone's skin color was that wrote the Bible because it's the spirit of the living God that used people to write it. The Bible was also written by Jewish people who had dark Middle Eastern complexion. So I'm not sure where people get this idea that evil white men wrote it, but that's a whole other story. Number nine says, create false teachings and counterfeit spirituality. I would introduce teachings that are close to the truth, but ultimately lead people astray, making them feel spiritual while subtly pulling them away from the gospel. Basically, that's all of these other religions outside of Christ, and it's even in the Christian community as well. We have all of these different denominations, you know, whether it's orthodoxy, Catholicism, Protestantism, all of this stuff is being used by Satan for one sole reason, and it's to divide us. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with Catholicism or orthodoxy, and I would even call myself a Protestant because I just believe in biblical Christianity, which existed way before Martin Luther and Catholicism, basically the church in the book of Acts. But unfortunately, a lot of people have formed their own factions and their own cults, which do err away from the word of God, and it makes them feel spiritual it makes them feel godly, but in reality, they're still far from the truth. Number 10, isolate individuals. Encourage feelings of loneliness or unworthiness, leading people to withdraw from Christian community and become more vulnerable to deception or despair. This is absolutely huge. I've seen a lot of people in my personal life isolate themselves and they end up falling away from the faith altogether. And that's because isolation is a very dangerous place to be in as a follower of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus had 12 people that he roamed with and this was literally God in human form. You need to be fellowshipping and you need to find a church that you can get submitted to as well as plugged into because we're not meant to do this walk alone as Christians. Here's two valuable scriptures you can meditate on if you're currently in an isolation period because isolation does lead to deception. Proverbs 18.1 says, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. When you isolate yourself, you do end up seeking your own desires. And to be completely transparent with you, there was a moment in my walk with Christ where I actually fell into sin because I was in isolation because my flesh allowed itself to get riled up to seek in my own desires, and I didn't really have any accountability at all. Another important scripture we can look at is Hebrews 10 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. There's this weird false saying that goes around saying, I don't need church, I am the church. And like half of that is true because we are the church, but that doesn't mean you don't need church because the word of God clearly warns us to not forsake the assembly of the saints. So yes, you are the church, but that doesn't mean that you need to be in isolation. God put this in his word because he knows the condition of the human mind if we continue to isolate ourselves. These answers from ChatGPT are shockingly way too close to the nail in what the devil is doing to believers in these last days. But with scripture, we can counter these lies and continue to fight the good fight of faith until the very end. If you made it all the way till the end of the video, I want you to comment down below, God's truth is in me. If you guys want to financially sow into this ministry, I have an offering link that's in the description or I have merch you can buy, which is also linked in the description. If you guys want to watch my last video, simply click up here. Or if you guys want to subscribe to the channel, simply click up here. I'll see you guys very soon for another video. I love you guys so much. May God bless all of you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Take care and peace out.